Hi, this is Greg from Structure Toolkit. In this video, we are going through the design of a bolted timber connection, where we will be looking at a timber floor beam that is bolted to a steel column with a steel cleat plate. You can design a timber bolted connection by using the timber joints module from the desktop. Within this module, you are able to design a nailed, screwed or bolted connection for shear, tension, moment and pullout in accordance with AS 1720.1 timber structures. You are also able to use this module to design for bearing. In this video, we'll be just focusing on the bolts tab of the module, but the nails and screws have a very similar layout. Our example for this video will be a timber floor beam that is simply supported by a steel column with a bolted steel cleat plate. The floor beam will therefore be transferring a shear force reaction through the bolts and cleat plate that then transfers into the column. A bolted cleat plate connection is considered a flexible connection, where the cleat connection to the supported member does not develop any moment and is able to rotate. That being said, there is a moment applied by the cleat to the supporting column due to the eccentricity of the vertical shear force applied. We won't be covering the design of the cleat plate itself in this video however, as we have gone through it previously in our steel cleat plate connection design video, where we looked at a steel beam connected to a steel column. You can design a cleat plate by using the cleat plate design module as required. Typically speaking, standard cleat plates will not be the critical component of a timber beam to column connection design. So what we'll be doing then in this video is working out the size, number and layout of the bolts required to support the end of our timber beam. We have already completed the design of our floor beam and calculated its end reaction, so we can get straight into the connection design. If you want to learn more about how to design a beam, have a look at our beam design video. So we'll start by opening up a timber joints document. In here we can pick between the four different design types using the tabs at the bottom. Nail screws and bolts all have a similar design process and layout. So although we're only covering bolts, you should still get an understanding of the general idea for nails and screws also. So to start designing our bolted connection, we'll select the bolts tab. The first thing we'll be looking at is our loading section. Our category will be two as we're designing the support for a primary framing member and our load duration will be floor. This will affect our K1 duration factor, which gets used in a number of the design checks in this module. Our loads are then split into two sections. Type one, which is for the design of a bolted connection to resist lateral loads. And type two, which is for bolts loaded in direct tension. Our shear force reaction is a lateral load, so we'll only be looking at a type one design check. Although it might seem obvious that we then just enter our shear force into our design shear, what we actually need to consider is our design force direction relative to our timber grain. AS1720 provides a diagram for this that can help, which has also been included on the right in the notes section here. We know our shear force is going to go across the depth of the beam, and for standard timber beams, the grain is going to be along the span. So in this case, we know that our force will be the shear input. Depending on the type of connection you are designing, you may instead find you have an axial force. This will be a good time to emphasize that because the direction of load relative to grain affects the design capacity for a bolted connection, two timber members connected together at different angles will most likely require two separate designs. Moving forward, if we look at our already designed timber floor beam, we can see that our reaction is 10.7 kilonewtons. So we'll put that value into our shear input. The other force inputs we will be leaving as zero, but we'll touch on the different design checks they are associated with as we go through a bolted connection design. Next, we have the fixed in geometry. A common bolt size for a tim connection is an M12, so we'll start with that. Now our bolt rows and column inputs 
are a bit more complex than just putting the numbers in and then you're done, as they relate to the generate button at the top right of the module. Whereupon changing these numbers, we can click generate, which will create a layout or grid of fixings in a table further below, which then gets used for all the design checks. For now, we'll leave this as is and come back to it once we finish all our other inputs. We won't have metal side plates on both sides, so we'll leave this input as no. This input relates to K16, which we'll see later. Transverse restraint relates to restraint against timber shrinkage. As we'll be using a seasoned timber, this doesn't matter, so we'll leave it as it is. This input relates to K17, which we will also see later. Our washer will be a standard round washer, which for M12 bolts needs to be 55mm diameter by 3mm thickness. Note that this input relates to type 2 joint capacity, so technically doesn't matter in our case. We then have the number of members in the connection group. As our connection will comprise of the timber beam and a cleat, it will then be 2. This input relates to the effective timber thickness and will affect the characteristic capacity used for the joint capacity calculation. Refer to table 4.9 and 4.10 for details. As our second member is a cleat, we'll then tick yes to this option. Now we get to the member itself. If we go back to our designed beam, we can see we arrived at a 290 by 45 F17 KD hardwood. So back in our joint design, we can input a thickness of 45 millimeters and a depth of 290. The thickness gets used for our effective timber thickness, which we spoke about before. And the depth is then to ensure whatever bolt layout we end up with will fit within the depth and also meet any edge distance requirements. With our beam geometry filled out, now would be a good time to also assign our timber grade. The easiest way to do this is to press the select grade button at the top right and pick the relevant grade from the drop down. There are also options in here for custom as needed. Our grade is F17, so we'll select that. If you scroll down a bit, you can also alter the strength and joint group as needed. Our final set of inputs are our bolt spacing and edge and end distances. Generally speaking, unless you plan to have a very specific bolt layout, leaving these as default is usually the easiest. Their default values are set up so that they will always set themselves to the minimum value allowed for your current bolt, effective thickness value, timber type, and load directions. The calculations for these minimum values are shown in the section below. These inputs are also used for the generate button above, which we'll talk more about now as we've covered all our main inputs. As we have already discussed, the generate button will create a bolt layout based on our bolt rows and column input. The generate button also uses the member geometry, bolt spacing, and edge and end distances in order to create a geometrically compliant bolted connection. A non-compliant connection can be generated if the user wants, but will be warned when doing so. To show this in action, we'll try generating a connection with three rows and three columns, giving us nine bolts in total. Right away, we can see error messages appearing telling us to press the generate button. So we'll press it. Now, as our bolt spacing and edge and end distances probably don't match up perfectly with our member depth, we'll need to decide where the bolt layout sits on the beam face. We can either align the edge distance to the top, bottom, or have it centrally located. Alternatively, we could choose distributed, which will space our bolts out further to match our input edge distance. We'll keep things nice and symmetrical and choose central. This will keep our bolt spacing as 60 millimeters. If we now scroll down to the bottom, We have a table and also a diagram that represents this generated bolted connection with an outline of the beam end and then the bolt centrally distributed. We can see our bolt spacings have been kept as 60 millimeters in both directions and our end distance as 60 millimeters also. 
If needed, we can also edit the table above to a certain degree. If for some reason we didn't want to have the central bolt being number five, we could just delete its row from the table. The number five bolt is then removed from the layout and the design calculations will update accordingly. We are also able to move the bolt's coordinate position, such as moving bolt two up slightly. However, what we will find that by moving bolt two up, we've invalidated the minimum vertical spacing between two and three, as stated in the description here. They've also turned red on the diagram and now provide no contribution to the design capacities calculated. This setup provides an extremely flexible but easy to use approach to designing effectively infinite types of bolt layouts. Now that we understand how the generate works, we can think about what would be an appropriate layout for our design. Typically for this kind of connection, you would only have one line of bolts. So our three lines here is probably a bit excessive. We'll start by using two bolts in one vertical line, go through the different design checks and then readjust as needed. For our layouts, we'll be using the central distribution. With our new bolt layout generated, we can quickly check below again to ensure it's what we intended. Note you can use the split function here if you want to be constantly monitoring something in a different position of the module. We'll first look at our type 1 joint capacity check, which checks against lateral loads, also being the design check that relates to our connection. The equation for type 1 includes our duration factor K1, which is determined based on our load type being floor in our case. K16 is for metal side plates on both sides and closed fit holes. In our case this doesn't apply, so it just goes to 1. We then have K17, which relates to a reduction factor for multiple fastener joints when using unseasoned timber, so in our case it's just 1. N is then the number of bolts in our connection, and finally we have our characteristic capacity, which comes from tables in AS1720.1. Depending on the direction of the load relative to the grain, joint group and our effective timber thickness, which is calculated further up in the module. Note that for joints with forces in both directions, or a force at an angle to the grain, Hankinson's formula is used to calculate an equivalent characteristic capacity, as shown in clause 4.4.2.4c or equation 4.41. All these values multiplied together, along with our strength reduction factor, gives us a capacity of 10.13 kN, which is just slightly under our design force, so we'll need to revise our connection later on. Another kind of type 1 joint is in-plane bending. Although AS1720 provide in-plane moment capacities for nail and screw joints, bolts are not covered. So if you are designing a bolted connection for moment, there is no direct way to check your capacity using the code. However, the code does indirectly provide us with some tools that can be used to arrive at one approach of designing for moment. We know an implied moment about a bolted connection will result in forces distributed out into each bolt in different directions. Using Hankinson's formula provided in AS1720, we were able to determine the capacity of a connection loaded at an angle to the grain. So if we are able to somehow determine the forces in each of our bolts for a given moment, we could check the lateral capacity of each individual bolt bearing against the timber. When designing bolt groups in steel design for in-plane moment, there are a variety of methods that can be used to determine the force in each bolt. One such method is the elastic or linear method, which is outlined in the AISC Design of Structural Connections Handbook, commonly referred to as the Green Book. The method determines the force in each bolt by multiplying the applied moment by the distance from the centroid of the bolt group to the bolt in question, and dividing this by the polar moment area of the bolt group. With this method then applied to a timber bolted connection, we can determine the sum of the forces on each individual bolt, determine the overall angle of this force, and then the subsequent type 1 capacity for each bolt. 
The calculations for this are summarized in the table at the bottom of the module. From this, a critical bolt from the group is found and is shown in the type one moment section above, displaying its force and capacity and also utilization ratio. As we don't have a moment applied in our case, the force and capacity are the same as our type one check without moment, just being divided by the number of bolts present. Finally, we have our type two joint design check, being for bolts in tension or withdrawal. The formula presented is similar in form for the type one check, but with different variables. First, we have the strength reduction factor, then duration factor K1 is used again, like with type one joints. We have a K7 factor that relates to the length of bearing of our washer, using table 4.11 for the length of bearing, and then table 2.6 to determine the factor's value. N is then the number of fixings, like with type one joints. Next, we have FPJ, which is the characteristic value used to determine the characteristic bearing capacity for timber joints and can be found in table C6 and depends on joint group. And finally, we have the area of the washer being used. These calculate out to give our total pullout capacity. As a side note, there is also another calculation at the bottom of the module that deals with eccentric joints as needed. Refer to clause 4.4.6 for more information as needed. Now with all the checks understood, we can finish off our design. If we scroll up to the top, we can see we're just slightly over capacity, so we'll probably need to add another bolt. We can do this by making our bolt rows three, and then click generate again, using the central option to distribute the bolts. This then brings us under our capacity, and if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see what it looks like. And with that, our design is done. Additional checks that have not been considered are the cleat plate design check and a bolt shear check. This can be done by either using the bolts or reference module for the bolts and the cleat plate module for the cleat. Though for timber connections, these components are typically never critical. That about covers all you need to know for designing a bolted timber connection in structural toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.